Hello, I'm uh, Christopher Bowen from Interview Magazine, and thank you for coming. I just wanted to say what an honor it is uh, to be partnering with Penn and uh, to thank Jakob and Salman Rushdie uh, for the opportunity. Um, there's a lot of stories about how interviews started and why Andy Warhol started it in 1968. And one was uh, that he said that he to give the kids something to do. And uh, what they did was not so much take pictures, because in the early days it was mostly pickup, but they had conversations. Um, and it's so nice to see these conversations uh, taking on second lives, third lives. And, um, but you're not here for that. You're here to, to uh, listen to a conversation uh, or a number of conversations with uh, Michael Stipe. And the interviewer uh, is novelist Stacy Dresmo, and the actor playing Michael at different stages is Brian Hestert. And Michael will be playing himself today. So without further ado. Okay. We're going to start in 2005. Um, Jared McNeil interviews assistant editor, dials Michael Stipe's number, phone rings. David Belisle, Stipe's tour assistant, picks up. Hello. Is Michael Stipe there, please? Who's calling? Interview Magazine. Oh, okay, hold on. Michael, they're calling from Interview. Uh, can, you, can you hold on for a second? <laughs> um, maybe, maybe we should call back, or, or at least give him a minute. Shh. Hello? M Michael? Yes? Hi, it's, it's Interview Magazine calling. Oh, did you, did you just call? We've actually just been on hold. You, you're kidding. Not at all. I've been, I'm so sorry, I've been in the shower, I was just going to call you back. Oh, there, there's no need to apologize. Would you like a few more minutes to get ready? Uh, I'm actually ready now. Great, let me conference you in with Ingrid. Now I'm Ingrid. Hello? Hi, Ingrid, how are you? I didn't realize your man was on hold there. I was in the shower. We heard the whole thing. It was really funny. Oh, God. <laughs> so you guys were in the bathroom with me the whole time. Well, after we heard the toilet flush, I decided I'd better give you your privacy. But now I'm back. Um, so I'd like to begin our conversation with the band's new record, Around the Sun. Rather than going for that old-fashioned idea that art has to be timeless, it seems that you and the band wanted something that really feels like it represents the shape of now. Uh, that's exactly right. Timelessness was something that seemed important to me in my early 20s when we were making our first records. And I don't know where that came from. Maybe it came from my art school teachings. We inherit this idea that art's supposed to be timeless which is really an impossible notion since history is always being revised. For so long, the goal of timelessness was how art was judged. The question was always, will it last? And I always felt the answer was number one, who knows what will last? How do we know if we'll last? And number two, with all the great art that I've ever seen in my life, part of what makes it so vibrant and alive is that in looking at it, you understand the moment in which it was made. So for me, the best stuff will show people in 50 years what we're going through now. It achieves that at timelessness, but not out of some goal that it will last, but because of its ability to pin down how we feel right now. I, I know. My opinion has drastically changed. What it's about now is now. If you think about art and music or any creative medium as a conduit to the world we're moving through, you want something that helps you realize who you are, what you think, and what opinions you hold in the right now. What's interesting about what you're saying is that you, Peter Buck, and Mike Mills began to work on Around the Sun before we hit the state of emergency and the resurgence of activism that I think our culture has been feeling lately, didn't you? We started to work uh, the record during the Great Quiet, really, which is the period right after 9-11 when people felt held down. Okay, so I want to stop there. and. Mm -hmm and ask, because that, that phrase, the great quiet, um, do you see that period, the great quiet, or the period just after any differently now? It's almost 10 years ago that, that this interview was conducted. Uh, I, I went to, I was invited to Woodstock last weekend, 
uh, to um, an opening uh, by a, a very dear friend who I've known most of my life of pottery and furniture. And so I went. And on the way up, I was um, I, on the train. I was thinking, I, I, I made two records in Woodstock. Uh, uh, 1989, my band worked on a record called Green uh, at Bearsville Studios in Woodstock. And then in 1990 or 91, I think we worked on a record called Out of Time there. And so and I was bored to tears the whole time. It was awful. I hated it. <laughs> but, I was think, but I thought, oh, th th this will be kind of a nice like, visit upstate. And I wonder, well, when is the last time I was here? And I, so we get there, and I'm, I'm thinking, I can't remember the last time I was here. And then I remembered it was actually 9-11. Uh, when I mm. fled the city in a Volkswagen, mm. uh, I went to a friend's house upstate uh, mm. t just to get out of New York because it was such a mess. The Great Quiet, I don't actually remember why I called it that. Maybe because people didn't feel like they could say things uh, in, for a period of time. And Martin t t touched on that uh, earlier tonight uh, in, in talking about novelists, uh, um, the, 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 the gestation period through which uh, artists or creative people m might have to kind of hold, hold the line until, um, uh, until you can, can kind of actually focus, on, uh, focus in on or concentrate on something uh, as, as, as life-altering as that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A kind of period of Is that what you asked? I, I'm yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just thinking about, about looking back. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. we'll say yes. Um, <laughs> and is that why you started the record then? Uh, no, it just happened to be that a great tragedy occurred and we had a record to make. So I began with a very conscious idea of not allowing politics to enter into the work. Mm. I didn't want to write a political record. Mm. I want to stop there too. Okay. Because <laughs> um, um, that, that, really, that really jumped out at me is the, the you that felt just after 9-11, I didn't want to write a political record. Why didn't you want to write a political record? And then what, what changed? I think I felt like a lot of the work that I had done with REM uh, and a, a, was political or was, was, was um, we were really activists and, and that worked its way into the music sometimes in really uh, subtle, beautiful ways and, and sometimes in very ham-fisted, stupid ways. Um, I think after 9-11, I, 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 I just didn't want to I, you know, I, I carry a great deal of darkness. I'm a really happy person, as you know, we know each other. Mm -hmm. um, but I do carry a, 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 a huge amount of darkness, and so the, that, that, that landed on me like it did most people in New York and a lot of people around the world. It was an incredibly fucked up time. Uh, and I just didn't want to, I didn't want to go there. I wanted to go somewhere else. I, I, I felt like maybe we needed um, a salve or a balm rather than another fucking pop star telling us how we should feel or who we should be rebelling against, perhaps. I finally backed away from that, though, after trying a few songs and realizing that I was holding myself back. Mm -hmm. I, just quit, um, I just quit thinking about it and let the music come out of me. I've talked before about Paul Clay. When he taught at the Bauhaus, he would draw a circle. He would start at the bottom and say that this is an innocent, untrained, uneducated mm -hmm. mind. And as you move up the left side of the circle, you're learning everything there is to learn about your particular field until you reach the top. And at that point, you are completely educated and trained in whatever it is that you're studying. He said that that's when people become craftsmen or artisans, and that's fine. But when you move down the right side of the circle and you start to forget everything that you've learned, then you start to become an artist. And when you get to the point back at the bottom of the circle where you've forgotten everything, he said that is what creates an artist. I'm extrapolating here because I haven't read his lecture notes in 20 years, but what I took from it is that artists are conduits to something else, some energy that's in the air. And it's good and fine to be an artisan or a craftsman, but it's a real artist. Uh, a real artist is someone who learns everything and then forgets it again. I feel that over the past 24 years, I've come back to a place where I'm not thinking about what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not sitting down with the intention of writing a song called The Worst Joke Ever or I Wanted to Be Wrong. I'm not that smart. I don't write autobiographically, and I never have. But there's something in there, as an observer, as a voyeur, taking in the world around me, breathing it in, and really, really observing, which is what I do best. And if I can just turn off my thinking brain long enough to allow that unconscious voice to do all the work, then I wind up with the 55 minutes of music that comprise this new record. Every single one of these new songs came from that unconscious voice. I want to stop there, too. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that unconscious voice? I sort of have two questions. Um, was there a particular zone of that voice that went into around the sun? Like, is it the same, you know, 
sector of the unconscious each time. Um, and do you still believe in that? I definitely believe in it. And uh, interestingly, I, 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 I went to a lecture. I went to a, um, what, uh, like a symposium with uh, five artists uh, at MoMA the other day talking about Sigmar Polka. There's a beautiful, weird show of his work um, at MoMA right now. And, uh, one of them brought up, one, and three of, three of these five artists I, I, I really would lay down on the railroad tracks for. I would completely admire them for their work. Um, but, but they were talking about shamanism in art and how that's kind of this like old fashioned, I read between the lines, like hippie way of looking at what, what artists are and what purpose they serve in a, a larger community. And I wanted to stand up in the back of the room and be like, I. Uh, I have, a, I have a different opinion about this. <laughs> um, maybe, uh, maybe it's not as romantic as we might want it to be, but I do think that when, when anyone, whether you, you consider yourself an artist or not, anyone who's doing something creative or something that, that where they're, they're stepping outside of who they are in the moment and they're doing, uh, I'm, I'm losing myself already here, hang on a second. Help the unconscious voice. Me. Yeah. Yeah, the unconscious voice. <laughs> and is it the same? You know, it's like it's like you look for that unconscious voice to make around the sun and then is there kind of a different part of the ocean that you go to to make another record, shamanism, believing in it? That um that was, by the way, our most hated record. <laughs> it's really? funny. Yeah, people really despised it, including our my former guitar player Peter just hated that record. But um why? I don't know. I mean, I didn't think it was that bad. We, there were a few missteps. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there were a few missteps, but there were some really great lyrics, and, and perhaps the best of them were when I allowed myself to be political and to really. Mm. I, there's a song. I think it's on that record called "I Wanted to Be Wrong," and it's 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 uh, it's a patriot myself, uh, and I, it's not autobiographic, but it is. I lived in Texas for five years as a young man, and I have this idea of, of and speaking of class, which Martin touched on so beautifully earlier. You know, we're the country that was founded without a, a language with which to discuss class. We have no idea still. Uh, I think r racism being our largest problem, class is probably our second largest problem as, 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 a, as a country. We're just too young and, and we're kind of dumb in that regard. But I knew kind of where George W. Bush came from and it, yeah. was, such a, um, it was such an insult to me that he was in the position that he was in as president twice mm -hmm. uh, with Cheney you know, kind of pulling the strings from behind. Mm. Mm. So wait, you were for shamanism or against shamanism? For, totally for. for. <laughs> and, but, I, but I do, you know, I, because if you've, if, if you've watched, oh, I mean, it's such an obvious example, but Patti Smith is a shamanistic yeah. performer. She, yeah. she, she's channeling something outside of herself when she's performing. I have a bit of that myself at my best. Um, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of someone who, a contemporary who does a really great job of that. I've never seen Lady Gaga perform, so I can't say. <laughs> uh, Le Leaky Lee, I saw um, recently uh, uh, perform, and she was astonished. She was astonishing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a dancer. There's a dancer, um, uh, Miguel um, Gutierrez, I think is the pronunciation of his name, but he's doing a thing at the Whitney this weekend, uh, which is a 15-minute dance piece uh, about queerness and aging and. It's one of the most beautiful, I, 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 I went to see it yesterday and I couldn't believe how outside of him, because I know the guy, mm -hmm. I couldn't believe how outside mm -hmm. of himself he was mm -hmm. and how in something else he was mm -hmm. to, to make it through this 50 minute piece. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one's own personal unconscious, but it's kind of the collective unconscious. I think so. Right? I mean, it's I, sort of that, that channeling. I think so, and but that's me talking. I, I, I feel, this is by the way so weird to hear my answers from earlier, uh, but I do agree with most of what's been said so far. <laughs> okay. okay, good, okay. I will say it's heavily edited yeah. by people like, uh, like Ingrid is a very good edit, editor, obviously she's done very well, but the way that I think and the way that I talk is incredibly circular, and so it doesn't, it's not, I'm not always an easy edit or interview like this. It's working out. No excuses. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, now I'm being Ingrid right. again. Um, I want to go back to that time you called the great quiet. Right. Well, for me, it was the result of an entire nation really suffering for the first time. Not a generation, but a nation. 
there was this collective loss of innocence. There, there had never been an attack like that on our soil, and we did not understand or recognize what it meant or how to react to it. Everyone just folded into themselves. The idea of raising a voice, much, much less raising a voice of dissent against the prevailing winds felt impossible. I feel like that was true across the board. That was the great quiet, and it lasted for a long time, much longer than I thought it would. But the atmosphere has really changed over the past three years. When I compare the feeling you're talking about to the feeling of the past six months, you can really sense the beginning of a collective rage and a collective understanding that the great quiet was filled not just with extraordinary heroism, courage, and sacrifice, but with a lot of confusion as well, and that all sorts of mix-ups and lies occurred afterwards. Well, for me, personally, the end of The Great Quiet came in the summer of 2003 at a Radiohead show in New York at the Beacon Theater. It was a televised thing and they had sold tickets for two dollars. The entire place was filled with fanatic Radiohead fans and typically at a Radiohead show everyone sings along to every song. They know every lyric. Sometimes you can't even hear Tom York's voice over the din of the audience. But this night, when they walked on stage and started playing the first song, the audience was quiet, reverential. No one was singing along to any of the songs. It wasn't until they played the song No Surprises that says, the government, they don't speak for us. And on that line, every single person in that room shouted out, the government, they don't speak for us. And on the next line of the lyric, they were dead quiet again. I was there with a group of people, including Q-Tip, and I looked over at Tip and his mouth was hanging open, and I was like, did that just happen? And he just nodded his head, yes. And afterwards, we were sitting around at the bar with Tom and the band, and Tip and I said, do you realize what happened tonight? And Tom said, I almost fell over. I almost couldn't sing the next line of the song. And that, to me, was the beginning of the end of the great quiet in New York. And of course, New Yorkers would get it first because they were there. Anyway, the sentiment and this feeling of the great quiet had ended for me in one line of one song in one moment in New York City and thus began a period of great personal activism. I think in the U.S. that is still spreading like wildfire across the country. Now I think people feel that they were quiet. Their feelings were sublimated for so long by this shock and this loss of innocence and this mass tragedy that we all shared. And now they want to raise their own voices. They're wearing t-shirts. They're arguing publicly. They're educating themselves. They're reading about stuff that's outside of the mainstream media. It seems to me that the anti-apathy that's manifested itself of late represents a real sea change in the way people are thinking and feeling today, which leads us to REM's participation in the Vote for Change tour. Five groups wanted to do something in a very important election year. We realized that we didn't have much, uh, that we'd have a much stronger and louder voice if we combined our efforts and did a tour with everyone working together. And so it was REM, Bruce Springsteen, Dave Matthews, the Dixie Chicks, and Pearl Jam. The idea was that we would swoop down into a swing state and everyone would play at different venues in different cities in the same night and then we'd pick up and move on to the next swing state and do the same thing. And what did you walk away from that experience feeling? It felt like I could celebrate activism and I could celebrate wanting to be involved. I, I just felt like we did what we could, you know? We put our yard sign in our yard and our yard just happened to be a stage. And I agree with you that this feeling of people raising their voices and having a say in the direction of the country has been activated. Okay, so I want to pause there because one thing that's easy to forget in this part is that you're saying this actually a year after we lost. Um, mm -hmm. This is 2005 and Bush had, had actually just gotten back into office and I was so struck, um, I mean, here in New York after Bush won in 2004, it was like, it was funereal, right? We were all just completely devastated and yet, here, you're so fired up and so optimistic. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts hearing that now? I was heavily edited. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure my thoughts can be as uh, concise as that, but uh, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm still, I, 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 I was, um, uh, I was uh, 10 years old in 1970. All my all the teachers that I had in elementary school were basically dropouts and hippies who had to get their first job. And so they were 19, 20, 21 years old, but they were all hippies. And those were the people that taught me. And you know, we would listen to um, um, Carly Simon record or um, um, uh, uh, Bob Dylan, uh, rather than doing English literature. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> 
That says a lot. Actually. But the, these are the people. So I, 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 I grew up with, I, I, took a, I took a class when I was um, in, um, probably it would have been the equivalent of like eighth grade, eighth grade or ninth grade. I took a, a year-long class called environmental science, and it was all about how in 19 whatever, 74, we had to really address the issues, the environmental issues that we were faced with in order to make the next generation, the generation after, blah, 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 and here we find ourselves. So I, I had this incredible u utopian kind of optimism coming out of that, uh, that in the, in the 80s, you know, being politicized by being in a band, traveling outside of the country, and acknowledging, recognizing what Reagan and, and his administration had done uh, to, to our, um, uh, to us as a country within our own borders, but also outside, like what people thought of us. It was really, uh, it was really a slap in the face to me. To then move from that to thinking that that's as bad as it could get. And then we get George W. and Cheney, and, and, and now we have fracking as a result of that, I think. And all kinds of other things. We have uh, what, what is, and I have a lot of criticisms that I could charge towards Obama and his administration. But all in all, I think he's a pretty great president, and, uh, and, and then there are things that I really don't like that they have done. But he caught the falling knife, and we all forget that six years in, uh, we needed someone who wasn't so deep in the pocket uh, in what House of Cards has now proven to us to be one of the most despicable and horrible jobs that you can hold. Uh, thank you, Kevin Spacey and uh, whoever wrote that, and, and uh, the great Robin Wright. But the, um, what, what, what was really bad actually got worse. And, and here's, here's George W. in his second term, neither of which I thought he actually won. Uh, and they're dismantling whatever's left after Reagan, which, and then Obama caught the falling knife and continues to kind of, I, it, right. the whole thing is, makes me not um, optimistic. And at 54, that's a really hard place to be. Yeah, yeah. Although at this moment, maybe it is because you were heavily edited, but you do sound like, I think I was pretty raw, raw yeah. at that yeah. point. Maybe I could see the end of Bush's second term coming. Right. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Now we're going to jump to 2008. Okay. Um, Jane Pratt is the interviewer. Okay. So we're sitting here in your apartment in Manhattan, and we're going to talk about, among other things, your new record, Accelerate. You and I get together all the time, but we don't really talk that much about our work. I always feel like I should be more of an expert at talking about REM than I am, because I know you so well. If we go back to when I first met you, it seems like you guys broke through at a time when people tended to give things like music a little bit more time than they give them now. That's true. In fact, that's a little bit of what the record is addressing thematically, which is how much things have accelerated. It feels like we're moving through our lives so much faster than we were 10 or 20 years ago. With this record, I'm kind of examining the 21st century from two perspectives. One is that of a 13-year-old in 1973 in my environmental science course, which was a year-long <laughs> class that talked about pollution and the renewable energy sources that we would rely upon in the future. That was I didn't read this, by the way. I have no that idea what. That's a great class. I, just so you know, <laughs> you're forcing. Because I would have let you do this. You're doing it much better than I am. I, would, I did. I, I have no idea what they're throwing at me here. Just to say, no excuses. But here, here we go. Right. No, it's great. It was a great. I'm still class. telling the same stories, though. That's a, that's a little embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need a new set of stories, Salman, maybe you can help me there. <laughs> yeah, go environmental science. Okay, at, go ahead. at the time, it felt like everything was possible and in our immediate future. We had just been through the civil rights movement and were in the midst of women's liberation. The other perspective is that of a 48-year-old who is looking back at the last eight years in our history. We're almost at the end of the first decade of the century, and I'm thinking for historians 50 years from now, what will this decade represent? And I'm sad to announce that I think this decade will represent nothing more than a terrible overreaction on the part of the Bush administration to the U.S. government and the U.S. government to 9/11. It's not even about 9/11. It's about this grotesque overreaction on the part of this government to what happened on that day, and where it has put us as a country. And then there's the fact that the world today is nowhere near what I imagined it would be as a 13-year-old. The future was not going to be all daffodils, but I didn't expect it to be the way it is either. It's like I imagined Flash Gordon, you know. So, Michael. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Has your view of the future changed? No. Flash Gordon? Oh, yes, definitely. You mean, I, I thought you meant since that interview. Uh, yes, yeah, since that interview. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty upset at yeah. the lack of progress that we've made in my lifetime. I really thought that we would have moved a lot faster than we did at yeah. changing the things that are 
really bringing us to crisis point. The environment being, you know, the, the biggest thing that I can think of. Yeah. But. Yeah. The Jetsons was my reference point. Yeah. I, I thought that we'd all have chairs that went down to points, but instead what we've got, uh, we've got what our circle of friends call the flat earthers. People who basically have some idea of the early Cold War period of the 1950s as this mid-century ideal of how things should be. Dick Cheney is probably the consummate flat earther. These flat earthers have been pulling us backwards and I just want us to progress. I want things to move forward and they're not. That's so true. We as a country are really so stuck I mean, we were both here in New York on 9-11, right in this area downtown where we are right now. And I do still see myself reacting out of fears that are left over from 9-11. So I understand why people feel that way. Yeah, me too. I didn't realize it until I was in London during the subway bombings a few years ago. When those attacks happened, I went to a place of abject panic in the complete shutdown mode. And I realized that I was not completely repaired from 9-11, but I, I think the real problem is that those feelings were exploited by people who wanted to keep everyone afraid. So I was struck again by the fact that um, this interview is 2008, and it, I'm not sure if it's, um, if, if Obama is about to win or if he is, or if he has already won. He, he had not won. He no. hadn't won quite no. yet. But even though things are about to get better, and there was so much push toward Obama, um, your tone is so much more angry, fearful, and, and somber. Um, what happened? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was being a little more honest because it was Jane yeah. and I having the conversation. Yeah. That might have been it. She's very close to me. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. I campaigned for Obama from the very beginning. I, I, yeah. I really had a feeling that he was probably going to changed things radically, um, and he hasn't changed things radically. He has changed things a lot. I'm neither an apologist nor, a, at this point, cheerleader of his, but I do want to re remind all of us, like, how bad it is to have a really bad president. It was and, very bad before And how Obama good it is to have, yeah. how good or okay it is to have a, a president who um, is in a, what might be the most compromised seat in the entire world and trying to do something really quite positive and progressive, not the opposite of the flat earthers. <laughs> Oval earthers. Mm -hmm. um, well, just to completely change subjects for a second, here is your Christmas present. Oh, yes. Both of us were super busy before Christmas, so I never got a chance to give it to you. I thought you might recognize the packaging. I do. It's a little Rogan something. Very exciting. Thank you. Isn't that cool? Absolutely so cool. It's a great, great black <laughs> shirt. Did, did you leave the price on there? Uh, no, that shouldn't be the price. Okay, I'm giving a hug. Thank you so much, sweetie. You're welcome. I'll put it on right after this. It's beautiful. It's a simple kind of op art design on a black t-shirt. It has an eyeball on a, a, a subtle sign of paranoia. I love Rogan. He's been doing this op art graphic thing in his designs that's super black and white. I've, mm. I've been really fascinated by that. I think it has crept into me. This is a fabric for a couch that I'm going to reupholster. You can attest for our <laughs> Panasonic Slimline tape recorder here that it is just about the most op art thing you've ever seen in your life. It's this weird, linear, black and white pattern. It plays tricks on your eyes when you look at it. The lines get farther and farther apart at certain points, and then they get closer and closer together. I have a, I have a couch that my grandmother had in Washington, D.C. in the 30s. I think the story goes that my nana bought it secondhand for less than $10. That couch sat in my Nana's front room for as long as I can remember. It was always the good couch. So when she died, we divided all of her stuff, and I took that couch because nobody else wanted it. It's only recently <laughs> that I found out that it's the couch my mom used to play on when she was a little girl. It's the couch that she would do her homework on and fall asleep on and stuff. And so suddenly this couch had a really different meaning for me. And then it broke. Tomas, my boyfriend, sat on the couch over Christmas, and the bottom fell out and it needed to be reupholstered because my dog had torn out a lot of the stuffing out of it. It sounds like I live in a flop house, which I don't. I, I didn't know if you would talk about Tomas. Yeah, well, he broke the couch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I wanted to ask, first of all, how the couch was. Um, but I also was really struck by that little moment where Jane says, I didn't know if you would talk about Tomas, which meant that there was 
there might have been some hesitation there, or it feels like a decision you were making in that moment, in that interview. What was that little moment? What year is it? 2008. Can I say it? Do you mind? It's all right. Is that a yes? Yes. OK. I'm, t I'm asking tomorrow. I'm not asking you. <laughs> <laughs> He was, uh, he was the mister for a long time because he was an actor. Uh, he studied uh, uh, in Paris as an actor and, and pursued a, 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 an acting job here. Um, and then woke up one day and decided that he was much more interested in taking photographs and becoming a portraitist and an artist. At which point, it didn't really matter if he was my boyfriend. And so he could mm. then be named as Thomas rather than the mister. I think that's what that was about. Yeah. Was that the first time that you had said his name uh, in public? I don't, I don't remember. I don't really know. Okay. Pro maybe. Yeah. And what, do you think it's because it was Jane interviewing you? No. We, I mean, you know, she, we, we, we knew full well what we were doing. Yeah. Um, uh, what are you asking? Just the decision, just the decision to, to, to sort of go public, to go public, to say his name, to, you know. This, but this references a lot of conversations that you and I have had up to this, I mean, before this evening, but yeah. Yeah. I think, pro yes, definitely, because it was Jane. Jane and I were lovers for eight years, and, uh, and that was, that was an, that's an amazing ongoing uh, uh, relationship uh, as non-lovers. Uh, her daughter is my goddaughter, and she's right. in my life very much. But I think knowing that it was Interview Magazine, the, um, for me, meant a lot because uh, Interview Magazine meant a lot to me. Growing up, and Warhol meant a lot to me. Growing up, and uh, the kind of the, the kind of the way that everyone just kind of spoke their mind without uh, without um, reservation. Yeah, without uh, whatever. Yeah. So Jane, interview, Tamar, artist, no longer uh, yeah. pursuing acting. It all made sense. Yeah. Okay. The couch, by the way, uh, back to that, yeah. uh, was easily fixed. <laughs> the the um, the op art. Um, uh, was won uh, the Design of the Year Award. Uh, it's Mary Mecco, which I didn't even know what that was, but they're, it's a big deal, right? Yeah. Anyway, it's a really cool looking couch now. <laughs> and it's, it's, in our, it's in our new apartment. Um, the, the surveillance eyeball on the uh, T-shirt, mm -hmm. um, Rogan's moved out of his op art thing, and he's now doing other things. But I've moved, uh, I, when I stopped making music, I started doing various types of um, tangible art works and things that you can touch. And in fact, I'm painting, which I'm terrified of, because right. uh, I'm a really shitty painter and a, a really bad. Like, um, but I'm I'm painting uh, giant surveillance eyeballs is one of the things that I'm doing. So. That's great. That's great. So the shirt really. It all good. comes back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to go to to an interview from 2011. Mm -hmm. um, earlier this year, Michael Stipe turned 51 and his band, R.E.M., released his 15th full-length album, Collapse Into Now. And as it turned out, this was also R.E.M.'s last record as a group. Um, and the interviewer here was Christopher Boland, who just introduced us. I know just from hanging with you around town that your early experiences of being in New York are very potent. When did you finally manage to visit? Uh, I came to New York for the first time with Peter Buck at age 19. We spent a week living out of a van on the street in front of a club in the West 60s called Hurrah. It's where Pylon <laughs> played. I saw Klaus Nomi play there. Mm. And Michael Giro's plan, uh, band, Before He Did Swans, they, they all wore cowboy boots and were so cool and had great hair. I was so jealous. I bought quaaludes at the urinal for everyone and we all got stoned. <laughs> I mean, totally fucked up. And we watched Klaus Nomi and Joe King Carrasco. I sat on the couch with Lester Bangs at this party somewhere. Uh, some, someone threw for pylon, and the only thing to eat was jelly beans and cheesecake. Were you trying to move to New York or just coming to get a look? It was 1979. I had to experience the city. I went and saw the singer from Suicide, Alan Vega. I love that band so much. We saw him perform at this little club. There was this beautiful girl who took the money at the door who didn't speak very much English. And there was a guitar player from Texas who was blonde and looked like a heroin addict. Everything was so romantic and sexy. <laughs> <laughs> So I, uh, <laughs> I got on the subway and got lost and went up to Harlem 
And uh, when I got on the subway, I realized that this is where suicide comes from, to sit on the subway and hear it in 3D and not just from a Charles Bronson movie. But to actually sit on the subway and hear the sound, I thought, that's suicide. That's where they come from. Now I get it. OK, here's what I want to know. There's so many things I want to know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer very, I'll, I'll try to be more brief. No, but um, what did you get in that moment? And have these moments continued to happen, right? Now I get it. In New York. With you, in New York, anywhere. Yes, yes and yes. OK, um, <laughs> you have to say more than that. Okay. <laughs> um, what did you get? What do you feel like you got that moment that you went back to in that interview where you said, you know, I was on the subway. I love this band, Suicide. You were sitting there, and you were like, oh my god, I get it. What did you get? What I got was where, like, I just imagined that Alan Vega and Martin Z, what was it? Jira. What's his name? No, uh, the, the two members of Suicide. Um, grew up with the sound of a subway. I, I, and I, 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 I had never been to New York. I'd never ridden on a subway, I don't think, at that point. Uh, but the band made perfect sense suddenly. It's this very heavy, industrial, kind of synthesized, yeah. rhythmic uh, music, like Kraftwerk, I guess, would be the only, your yeah. only kind of point of reference uh, when they put out their first album. So it was the sound. I got, got, I got where that influence came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it seemed to me like the future uh, as a 19, 18, 19 year old. Uh, I understood hearing it uh, on the subway that that, that's, that was the world that they lived in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. This city offered so much to me. It was only years later that I ended up having the experience that led me to write one of the only autobiographical songs of my entire career as a songwriter in the opening of the track, uh, in the opening track of Collapse into now called Discoverer. It's a song about discovery. It's about realizing that the city offers you this unbelievable potential and opportunity, all the things you were looking for in your teens and your 20s. That's what New York offered me. The lyrics are floating across Houston, this is where I am. I see the city rise up tall, the opportunities and possibilities. I have never felt so called. Remember the vodka espresso, the night of discovery. What's vodka espresso? Did I quote myself? How embarrassing. You did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that is a very significant for me, though. Uh, going into the making of that record, my band knew that, that it was going to be our last album. I was taking, as I have over the years, um, I was taking a few pages from Patti Smith. She made a record called Wave, which was Waving Goodbye. And, uh, uh, and that, was, that was her swan song uh, before she retired from music for 17 years, knowing full well that she was going to do it. And so that, that lyric uh, actually um, quotes uh, a line of hers uh, about the sea of possibilities. Yeah. And that's basically when I came to New York as, as a fan of Patti Smith and television and the Ramones and Blondie and Talking Heads and all the bands that came after. Um, the city opened itself up to me and, and, and said, you are here for a reason. This is, this is, this is why I exist, I being the city. And, and, and now you're home. Yeah. And New York was, from that moment on, my spiritual home. As, as people like William Burroughs became my spiritual godfather and, and the, the people that, that influenced uh, the, the type of music that brought me here in the first place. Mm -hmm. Has the romance with New York continued? Absolutely, I, 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 can, I can say, I, I, yes, I, yes. I was on the subway twice today and I, 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 I thought to myself, this is like, I'm not a very good reader. I have a terrible time reading um, uh, regular books and it, it take, I can do it, but it takes a really long time and it's really hard for me to do for a variety of reasons. Um, but I was on the subway and I was thinking to myself, this is my like version of a short story. Like I'm not writing songs anymore. I don't write other things right now, but. I'm collecting all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think it's coming out in other ways, which is, for me, interesting. But maybe not for you tonight. <laughs> but, but there will be something to see of it. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm thinking to myself, this, like, I, I, I tend to see kind of everything. And I'm taking in all the people on the subway train. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm making up little stories about them. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm also being myself in that moment mm -hmm. with the people that I'm with and the way that the conversation, the jokes, and the humor and the stupidity and the dumbness and the flatness and the boredom, the everything of it. Um, New York, uh, like, like all things, you know, when you're a teenager, things are ex extremely romantic and you have this kind of, um, and Martin referenced it again, you're, 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 you're so naive and so um, unafraid, so courageous in, in, in a way. Uh, that's a time to strike. That's a time to really like 
really jump off a cliff uh, uh, and, and leave your fears behind. Uh, and I kind of did that, but, but that, the, the reality is way, way different, as we all know. The reality of living in a city like this is way different from the 19-year-old dream. So it's from a romance to a marriage? It's not a marriage, because marriage is kind of a boring, uh, for, <laughs> I, I think. Uh, no, it's like, it's like, it's like the, 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 the realness of being here is, uh, for me, in, in immensely stimulating. That electroshock that Martin said maybe had changed for him, I still get it. Um, I also yell at people on the street now, you know, but I'm, uh, when I get upset. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I, I move with, with, within the city as if it is mine, mm. as if I'm a part of it now. Mm. And I feel like I am. These lyrics are about your first days in New York floating across Houston Street. Mm. It was years later that this moment actually happened. Uh, it's the feeling itself that took me 25 years to put into a lyric. I'm not an autobiographical writer. It, it, I'll take little elements here and there from things that I've actually experienced, counting eyelashes on a Sleeping Beauty, for example. That's a moment that actually happened, and I wrote it into a song called That My Most Beautiful. But the song itself isn't about the guy whose eyelashes I was counting. It was just a moment that I took. Michael, I wondered if you could talk about, it's such a hard thing to talk about, but why does one choose one moment over another. When you look back at all the lyrics that you've written, you know, what kind of collection of moments do you see? Sometimes it's the eyelashes, sometimes it's like, what's the frequency, Kenneth, right? Like, what makes us choose one thing over another? Or do you have a sense of that for yourself? For me, it's about writing, um, uh, because, because the format that I chose to work in is a pop song and everything is very, very condensed. So you have to get across this uh, immensity of a backstory using very few uh, uh, examples, right? And you don't have a lot of time to do it, and it's got to be catchy, and you've got to be able to sing along to it in the shower or wherever. And <laughs> so it's, in a, way, in a way, it's a very rigorous, very um, difficult uh, medium or format to work in. So you, I try to pick examples of something that, if I was teaching a class on how to, how to write a song and make it not just another stupid pop song, you put a, li a, a stupid like love song, you put a line in it like that about counting someone's eyelashes, and that's like, that's gold. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a moment, that's a real moment that everyone, all of us can picture. The obsession of, of waiting for someone to fall asleep or waking up with them still asleep and sitting there and counting their eyelashes. I mean, what, <laughs> you know, it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> Do the moments that you collect change now that you're like working with tactile things? I wake, the, up, with, I wake up with solutions to problems and that, that used to happen with songwriting, mm. not so much because um, songwriting, it's funny, I, tried, I actually tried to write a song recently and I realized how much uh, it, it, it's like white noise that blots out everything else in my life. I moved through three months of last summer trying to write a song for someone else just because I wanted to, I wanted to um, try it. And I realized that I had had these blinders on for so long because I was writing pop songs and trying to write. I, I walk around rhyming things with the word, you know, schism. I, I mean, but rhymes with schism. That's a really limited way to move through a dinner, through you know, a dinner party. <laughs> I, by the way, I, I didn't answer your question about uh, the vodka espresso. So I, I discovered. Yeah, the, what is vodka? I discovered that I went to a party on Houston Street, um, and I discovered the magic of um, good vodka, Stolichnaya, and good espresso. And if you if you, if, you, if you chase a shot of vodka with a shot of espresso, and you keep doing that over the course of an evening, you, you will find yourself wandering down the middle of Houston, <laughs> screaming, like your arms like this, screaming, this is, this is my moment. This is, and... Okay, we're gonna do that tonight. I, it actually happened, it actually happened. I, I recommend it highly. Okay. <laughs> Um, there's a certain similarity in tone between you and Patti Smith. I know she says she never really got into drugs, and I don't know your history with drugs. Maybe I'm wrong, and in the 80s you were an addict. Only until about 1983. What happened in 1983? I stopped taking drugs. <laughs> there were a lot of things that led up to it. One, uh, one thing was that a lover died, an ex of mine died in a car wreck, and, and I was really trashed when I found out about it, and I couldn't cry. I woke up the next morning and I said, that's it, so I quit then. It was horrible. A bunch of people died around that time, and she was, she was one of them. I, I wrote a song about her. That was when I still did pull from autobiographical material. I didn't really have my voice until after that, and also AIDS landed, and I was terrified. 
I was very scared, just as everyone was in the 80s. It was really hard to be sexually active and to sleep with men and women and not feel you had a responsibility in terms of having safe sex. And this was the Reagan years when they were talking about internment camps for HIV positive mm -hmm. people and people with AIDS. The straight community was freaking out because in their minds this was a gay disease and bisexual people were passing AIDS from the gay community to the straight community. Do you think your development as a songwriter was heavily influenced by Reagan and AIDS? There's definitely an apocalyptic subtext to your songs. No, I think my apocalyptic feelings went deeper than that. I'm, I'm really at peace with how afraid I am. What are you afraid of? <laughs> I'm afraid of everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not a naturally courageous person, but AIDS really brought it home. I mean, it was, it was right when I was 21 years old and came to New York and saw the first billboard about AIDS and was like, holy shit, this is for real. It was scary. And it was right at the time when I was in a band. And suddenly there were all these people who were available to me, men and women. And I was really having fun. But then there came the responsibility and feeling afraid and being afraid to get tested because you couldn't get tested anonymously. It was so fucked up. Our generation was supposed to be about trying to deal with nuclear concerns and environmental disasters. Suddenly Reagan is in office. I'm 21 years old. And you can die from fucking. It was like, I just started. I'm, I'm hitting my stride. Are you kidding me? I don't want to die. <laughs> What are you afraid of now? Public speaking. <laughs> 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 which, is, which is why I said yes to this. <laughs> How's it going? I'm, I, I feel like I'm permanently blushing, but... You can't uh, tell. Okay, good, all right. Uh, not bad. Yeah. I'm okay, I'm, 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 I, I, I decided uh, about two years ago that if someone asked me to do something that really made me uncomfortable, that I would seriously consider saying yes. And it started with um, <coughs> doing uh, speaking, public speaking in London at the Serpentine Gallery, which in front of all these amazing artists and these amazing academic thinkers, and I'm not that at all. And uh, it was t absolutely terrifying, but I did it. That's so, I have to say that's just so surprising that, that to be terrified of this after playing like stadiums? That's different though, that's a different thing. <laughs> it, what, what I mean is singing, singing with my band uh, was for me a very natural and very easy thing for me to do. It was the only time I was ever, ever once afraid would be doing live television. Huh? Something about the camera just felt like it was sucking my soul. Yeah. And I, did, I had no idea where it was going. Um, any, any other time, I, I was not afraid at all. Even when my voice failed me, I, I, I would just jump around more. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's, ama that's amazing. Do you ever feel weird about fame? It does allow you to meet amazing people on this planet and do unimaginable things. I love it. With the, with the difficult parts of fame, that alone makes it so worthwhile because of the doors it's open for me. I've worked really, really, really hard at what I do. I give it the best I can possibly give at whatever moment in time. But it's exciting to have been able to meet my heroes, being able to sit down with William S. Burroughs and have a conversation. Hmm. Okay, oh, that was another place I really wanted to stop. Because um, I just have to say, I have to think that it has to be a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and also, how has, it, how has it been all this time? Because you've been famous for a long time now, yeah. right? Yeah, but I'm a different kind of fame than people, other people in my life who are, who are way famous, who get like, you know, is that what you're asking? Yeah. I, I managed somehow to hit this mark where um, I can go into restaurants and get a great table, and people are like, people will say like, thank you for the work that you've done. And I get to say, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure. I'm glad the music was there for you, whatever. I love that. But I also can ride on the subway and not cause you know, a minor riot because no one recognizes me. And I've, I've discovered the power of a beard. Like I can, <laughs> I can if I have a beard, and uh, then I'm, I'm pretty, uh, New, New Yorkers are pretty savvy. They pretty much see everything, but they also leave everyone alone, so. I have friends who really have a problem with fame. I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm able to kind of do whatever I want to do and not, not have much of an issue. Okay. This will be our last question, sure. um, and it's just it's to you. Um, oh, okay. This is from an earlier interview, but I'm going to reframe it. Um, you grew up on an army base, on a series of army bases. Your dad was in the military. Um, and you've talked about going into the commissary and finding, like, the, the village voice and all yeah. this stuff. Picture a kid on an army base going to the commissary and coming across around the sun, accelerate, collapse into now, anything by REM. 
What do you hope it would give that kid? A window into themselves and into something. If, if their lives are quite small or limited, that what that would provide would be um, some uh, some window or door into a, another world where you know people are like you, whatever that like you is. Uh, I was very much an outsider growing up, and uh, and punk rock, and I think queerness had a huge uh, had a lot to do with it. But punk rock really provided for me a way of seeing beyond the limitations of the world that I was in and, 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 and recognizing or acknowledging that I might have something that, although as a teenager it was, um, it was a fantasy idea that I could become an artist or that I could write a song or create something or that I even had a voice. I didn't know that I had a voice, um, an actual voice. Um, it, it provided me with that bravado and that courage to, to just go, fuck it, that's what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to do it. And I did, and I happened to, well, we worked very, very hard with a modicum of talent, and I ha we happened to be very successful at what we did, and I'm very, very proud of that. Okay, we're going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.